Okay, so next up it's my pleasure to introduce, uh, I should have had him pronounce his name for me, so I'm going to mangle it, he's going to correct me. Uh, to introduce Benjamin Cape uh, Kane. Kent? Cape Kane. Cape Kane? Yeah. Okay, wow. It's a local name, fun word. Okay. Uh, Anyway, so he's been here for a year or so at, the, at, at Princess Margaret uh, Cancer uh, and affiliated with the Medical Biophysics and Computer Science Departments here at the University of Toronto. And uh, before that, he did uh, postdoc at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute uh, in, in Boston with John Quackenbush. And uh, before that, he did his PhD uh, looking at uh, signatures, gene signatures in breast cancer um, at the, the Free University of Brussels. If I can avoid pronouncing French, thanks. Um, and uh, did his master's there also, um, looking at breast cancer signatures uh, before that. Uh, so lots of microarray analysis, integrative analysis, and I think he's going to tell us more about biomarkers today. Thanks. Thank you, Fritz. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's my first Torberg experience. So it looks pretty positive so far. Um, so I did a lot of work in, in, in breast cancer, mainly looking at prognostic gene signature, but some way it got very boring with a lot of papers going on. and the same prediction performance all the time. So I decided to move to something a bit more challenging, which is therapy response prediction. And now I'll, I'll show you that it's actually more than challenging. Um, we have been pretty good uh, in the last uh, couple of, I mean, the last decades to actually pinpoint the hallmarks of cancer, but also to find therapies to target those. Uh, including, like, for instance, avoiding immune response. We have no fantastic anti-CTLA4 inhibitors to boost the immune system, uh, EGFR inhibitors to, uh, to target the sustaining uh, proliferative signaling. So we have all those drug targets and all those drugs. And somehow we found the easy, we found the easy drugs and the easy targets. But nowadays, if you look at the, uh, at the approval rate from the FDA, less and less drugs are being approved. It's not so much that we lack drugs or we don't know about the targets. We have all those things, but the drugs we found are actually active in a very small subset of patients. So now the goal is really to try to salvage those drugs by identifying the patients that are more likely to benefit from those, from those new therapies. And of course, we can leverage the fantastic molecular data that we are now able to, to, um, to generate from uh, the tumor, for instance. If you want to look at if you want to look at biomarkers of therapy response, you have many many different types of data you could use. Uh, the most straightforward may be to look at the patient tumor directly. So you, you have a clinical trial, you have a cohort of patients, you get the biopsy from the tumor, and you know the clinical outcome of the patient. You know whether that patient specifically responded well or not to to the therapy of interest. The, there are two main issues with that approach. First. The cohorts are usually very small. You cannot have like a clinical trial with thousands and thousands of patients. Of course you can have it, but it's extremely expensive. Um, second problem, but maybe more important, is actually that you can only look at therapies that have been approved in clinic. You cannot test random drugs on patients, of course. So if you want to, to get a bit more flexibility, you can look at in vivo uh, model systems like PDX, the patient derived xenograph. I think those are great models to you um, and graft the tumor into a mouse, so you have a kind of human uh, tumor growing in a mice. So you can challenge those mice with whatever drugs you want. Uh, ethically, it's much less challenging, but it's still very tedious and lengthy and, and expensive to do. So organizing a trial with a lot of, of mice and a lot of different PDXs could be, could be very challenging too. You can use other types of models, like genetically engineered mouse. They're a bit less like patient tumors, but they're still very valuable, but again, very, very time consuming and expensive. At the other end of the spectrum, you have the, you have the cancer cell line. So we all agree that those are very perfect models of the patient tumors. There is no cell line like real tumors. They're extremely cheap to work with. They don't really complain when you treat them with nasty drugs. So ethically, it's less challenging. And you can implement high throughput studies with those. So for those reasons, we have tons and tons of data about the response of those cancer cell lines to therapies. So this is the kind of, of model system I'll be using through, throughout that presentation. Uh, and this is usually the kind of design they use for those pharmacogenic studies. So the idea is the following. First, you profile, you molecularly profile those cancer cell lines at baseline before you treat them. So you get this collection of, of molecular features that somehow describe what makes those cancer cell lines so, so special. 
Then you treat them with drugs and you see what happens. Uh, in that case, you can look at the drug dose response curve. So on the y axis, you have the different drug on the x axis, you have the different um, drug concentrations, and on the y axis, you have the growth inhibition uh, induced by the drugs, and you have this. Yeah, I usually hit laser pointer. <laughs> 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 it's more shaky. And I don't do shaky science. My science is extremely rough. Um, <laughs> um, so there, there is this beautiful sigmoid curve, right? This is very the ideal case where you can see that the effect of the drugs, the, the cell lines are get are killed if you increase the drug concentration, uh, and you can summarize it in many different ways. So you can look at the IC50 or EC50. This is more or less the drug concentration you need to kill 50% of the cells. You can look at the area under or upper that those response curves. So there are many ways to summarize those curves. But at the end of the day, you hope to understand what are the cell lines that are more or less resistant to that drug. And those are that, that are highly sensitive to those, to the drug of, of interest. Okay, so it looks all good. Uh, and if you look at PubMed, biomarker, gene expression, cancer cell lines, whatever, you get thousands and thousands of papers. Here, those are, there are at least 1,000 papers looking at, especially at gene expression biomarkers. Um, however, the history of the field basically uh, tells us that it is not that simple. Uh, there is the big scandal at, at Duke University, I think it was five years ago, when Anil Bodhi claimed to have found some fantastic biomarkers of chemotherapy based on the MCI 60 panel, a small panel of 60 signs from the MCI and IH. And actually, the, the data were fabricated, all the validations were wrong. Um, a few years later, uh, Bagoli, the same guys who, who discovered the, the fraud of, of Anilopoti, actually published another paper um, discrediting um, the, some predictors uh, developed by the Medical Prognosis Institute. Um, again, saying that, yes, the predictions are better than random, but you can achieve actually better similar performance with just some traditional clinical histopathological parameters like the age of the patient, grade of the tumor, or whatever. So again, it challenged the concept of using uh, those molecular features, molecular profiles of cancer science uh, related to that drug response. So the question you can ask yourself at this stage is that, is it because of the sample size? Is it because they use those very small set of 60 salons? Uh, or is it because of the noise in the data? We, they are, those are cancer salons that don't come from uh, a random, uh, random sample. They come from a cancer, so they, they recapitulate some of the cancer, some of the, the carcinogenesis uh, um, uh, phenotypes. So they have to be useful somehow. So I got very excited in, when I started my lab in Montreal when those two studies got published. And the same issue of nature: one is a cancer genome project initiated by the Sanger Institute; the other one is uh, the Cancer Cell Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia from Novartis and the Broad Institute. And their principle is to increase, to, to screen an insanely large panel of cell lines to actually recapitulate the whole molecular diversity of cancer. That's the, that was their goal. And to treat those cell lines with, with a lot of drugs and try to find associations. So it was really a biomarker-oriented study. Those, those are, were biomarker-oriented studies. And you can see that they used almost a thousand cell lines each. So it was really a large panel. If you look at the intersection between those two uh, studies, you can actually see that they, were, they had 500 cancer signs in common, which was not too bad. Uh, they used Affymetrix uh, gene expression microarray, so we had roughly 12,000 12, genes uh, being assessed in those platforms. Um, the same institute looked only at 68 mutations in 68 genes, while, while the broad looked at 2,000, so there was a small overlap of 64. Um, and, but importantly, out of those 24 and 148 drugs that they um, screened, they had 15 in common. So for us, it was a good opportunity to, to investigate those data in more detail. So those are the 15 drugs. Um, the only cytotoxic drug they uh, actually have in common is paclitaxel. Uh, the other drugs are targeted uh, therapies. You have some uh, MEK inhibitor, ALK inhibitor, you have also the BCIBL1 gene fusion inhibitor. So it's a, it's a very large, diverse panel of drugs. So we got very excited about those data because for the first time we have this insanely large sample size to play with. And as a machine learner, my first, re my first reaction was actually to use those data to build and validate predictors. So that's what we did uh, in a paper early 2013 with 
with students in my lab, somewhere in the room actually. Um, so um, the framework was extremely simple. We took one study, we used CGP because it had a lot of drug sensitivity data. We used CGP to train classifiers that we first validated in cross-validation on the training set just to make sure that uh, the models were more or less valid. Then we take the, the, those models and we uh, challenge them. We, we validate them on CCLE, this other data set that is completely independent, new gene expression data, new drug sensitivity data. But because there were 500 cell lines in common, we decided to split that data set in two parts. One with the cell lines that were in common in CGP. In that case, those are biological replicates. You expect the, the model to be uh, extremely performant because the model has been fitted on those exact same cell lines uh, and drugs. And the other data set is the difference between CGP and CCLE, those remaining 500 cell lines, where it's much more challenging because the model has never so uh, I've never seen that kind of data before, so uh, you change more the generalization of, of the method. I won't bother you with the machine learning details, but we use five different approaches. They're extremely standard and well established. It's pretty boring, actually. Uh, the one is, is actually kind of exciting because you cannot do simpler than that. You just take the top features that is correlated, that is the most correlated with drug response. So it's a single gene. This is the simplest biomarker you can ever imagine. Then we, we have like this fancy method where, not really fancy, but those methods where we either take the top 30, we combine the prediction, or we build a multivariate with the top 30 features. Uh, we use minimum redundancy, maximum relevance to, to try to increase a little bit the diversity of the signal in the features. We use elastic net, penalized regression. The idea was not to come up with a new machine learning approach. It was really to try to um, uh, build different kinds of biomarkers and, and make sure that our conclusions were not specific to a given model or if it was to, to have a large panel to compare uh, the different models. So those are the, the results in cross-validation. So in that case we used IC50 as a drug sensitivity measure. So it is again the, the drug concentration you need to kill 50% of the cells. So if the IC50 is very low um, you actually, uh, use of the drug is very active, it kills the cells uh, pretty efficiently. As you can see, for nine of the drugs, <coughs> for nine of the drugs, we got decent biomarkers. On the y-axis, you have the concomitance index, which is a generalization of the area under the rock curve. So uh, at 65, we decided that that was like a minimum threshold for a model to be uh, considered um, uh, predictive or efficient. Um, for some models, it didn't work at all. And that may be just because gene expression is not predictive for those drugs, and that kind of makes sense. Nelotinib is, is very well predicted. The response to nelotinib is well predicted by the gene, the, the gene fusion, BCR-ABL1, or the level of, of ABM protein. It has nothing really to do with, with the expression itself. So we were not too surprised by this. So let's say we had eight working models that we've tried to validate on CCLA. So the next slide will show the performance of the model on the same cell line. So keep in mind that those are the same cell line with the same drug. So it was supposed to be extremely easy to predict. And this is what we observed. Uh, we are pretty disappointed to see that so many model, uh, models failed actually to validate. Uh, only 17 AG, interestingly, there is a single gene that seems to be highly consistent between the training and test set. And it makes sense because it's, it's NQ1, it's the gene that is the protein that metabolizes the drug to its active form. So it has to be there. It's a good biomarker of response. And we have two other drugs where the models were more or less uh, predictive, but for the large majority of the drugs, it didn't work, right? So, of course, if you look at the new science, you add this layer of complexity, uh, you didn't really improve the results, right? Uh, except for 17 AG, where again, that single gene is a fantastic biomarker. The rest of the models failed uh, pretty miserably. So, from a machine learning perspective, it was all very disappointing. True, gene expression is not the only molecular features you can use to build those models. So maybe looking at gene uh, mutations, gene fusion, may help you a little bit. But somehow, even model that seems to work well in the training set didn't validate on the test set. So the question we ask ourselves is, was it due to biological variation? Maybe those signs were very different into the two studies, or maybe some biases or batch effects we're not aware of, or, or, or the noise in the data. And I think it's, it's still a pretty concerning issue. 
when when you see papers coming out all the time about how to use those uh, cancer cell-like data to predict um, uh, response in patients. So my argument is that if you're not able to reliably predict response in cell lines data, I'm not so sure that you can do it in vivo in patients' data. But again, papers got published all the time. So we decided to investigate that, that a little bit more, and that's where we made a, a surprising discovery that somehow uh, got us this, this nice publication where we looked at the consistency across the, the, the large pharmacogenic studies, uh, specifically CCLE and CGP. So those are the kind of, of data you have in those studies. As I said before, you have the input data, you have the molecular profile. So for each cell line, and let's say a gene, you have a measurement. So you want that measurement, let's say expression here, to be consistent across the two studies. And in terms of output data, you have the drug phenotype. That's what you try to predict. And here for each pair of cell lines treated with a drug, you have a measure of the sensitivity that you would like to have to be consistent across the two studies. If those two data, those two data are consistent, consistent then this exercise of building a model and predicting and, and validating the model on it and the data makes sense. If those two if those data are highly consistent, you will never, never uh, manage to validate your models. Okay, so if you look at the paper, we made a mistake. We confounded, we were confused between two types of correlation. A lot of people had the pleasure to tell us that we were wrong. So I would like to clarify it here. It's a good audience for that, I guess. So you can look at the concordance between the two studies at two different levels. Either you do it between some lines. So it means that you take a cell line in the two studies, you take the same cell line, and you compare the gene expression profile. That, for me, was the obvious thing to do. Um, but you can also do it with the drug profile. You can take we can take the same summaries of the two studies and see how they are, those summaries are characterized by the drug sensitivity. So that's what uh, we call, and other people call, the between summary correlation. There is another kind of correlation you can do. It's the across summary. So the idea here is that you take a drug in the two studies and you see how the, the sensitivity measurements across all the summaries actually agree between the two studies. You can do that with a single gene as well, all the expression profiles across the science agree uh, between the two studies. And actually, that's the most relevant uh, concordance in terms of biomarker, because you want the science measurements at the drug level and the gene level to be consistent to be able to build uh, good uh, predictors. And the mistake we did, we made, is that when we compare the science, we compare the correlation between the science. And when we compare the drug, we looked at the across saline correlation. And you cannot compare those correlations. They are pretty different. So we ended up in the paper, we ended up with the conclusion that gene expression was much more concordant than the drug sensitivity data. And I'll show you that somehow that still holds. So that's why the paper is still online, I guess. So here you go. Uh, you have the two types of correlation. So if you look at between sunlines, the expression, the, the, the expression profiles of the, of the similar sunlines in two studies were actually extremely well, uh, well uh, correlated. Um, I agree that it could be also the dimension of the problem as well, but, but still a very consistent signal. And for the drugs, it was not so much the case. <coughs> and, and the difference is significant. If you look at across sunlines, suddenly for any given gene, the ranking of sunlines based on the expression of that gene is kind of not so concordant, but it's still, uh, it, it's still much higher than any drug sensitivity profiles. So we somehow um, discovered that the drug sensitivity profiles were highly, were significantly less consistent or concordant than correlated than uh, gene expression profiles. And that for us was very surprising. The microarray technology has this reputation of being noisy. Gene expression in general is, is kind of a noisy measurement to, to generate. But drug sensitivity data, not being a pharmacogenic uh, ph pharmacologist myself, I thought it was somehow a very stable phenotype. But it's not, it seems to not be the case here. And this is what um, you can see on the scatter plot. If the two studies reported exactly the same measure for any given drug, any given sunlight, all the lines should, all the points should lie on the diagonal. But it's, it's not the case. Here, uh, I have to precise that, I have to say that uh, one of the studies, CCLE, decided to cut the IC50 
to a placeholder value. So it means that if the drug never killed 50% of the, of the cells, instead of extrapolating the curve and make a prediction, they decided to cap it to the maximum concentration, saying that that drug never managed to kill 50% of the cells, therefore that's the maximum concentration uh, uh, they reported. Why in um, CGP they actually extrapolated the curve and tried to see when, at which kind of concentration, 50% of the, of the cells would be, uh, would be killed. So there, there is this different uh, technology, but if you look at the area under the curve, which should be kind of similar between the two studies, where no value were kept, um, and it's a very simple study. So you can see again that for most of the drugs, the correlation, the consistency across the two studies were quite poor. So for us, that, that seems to be the issue. If your outcome data do not agree between the train set and the validation set, no model on Earth would be smart enough to change your mind when they say the same sign and the same drug. So it seems that that would be the source of, of inconsistency. Um, some people argue that correlation is a very bad measurement of <coughs> importance between the two studies, and we actually agree with them uh, for some drugs. So here I show, I show two different kind of, kinds of drugs. One has a broad effect. Many signs are sensitive, many signs are resistant. It's a beautiful continuum of sensitivity. So it seems that those drugs uh, kill a lot of different cells. On the uh, right side, you have a drug with extremely targeted effect. That's nilotinib again, uh, targeting BCIB L1 infusion. So it concerns a very, very small subset of the drugs. Actually, only according to that part, only two or three are actually sensitive. And they, they both they all harbor the BCIB L1 uh, gene fusion. So here, correlation doesn't make really much sense because most of the cells will be resistant. But this is worse. There is no correlation within this big pool of resistant cells. While there are some consistent outliers, they are consistent in the two studies. They are both outliers. They are outliers in, in both studies. So somehow, correlation here is unfair. You have a correlation of 0.14, but somehow the two studies kind of agree with each other, except maybe for that, for the point on the, on the top left. So I decided to, to, to come up with a new measure of compliance between the two studies. Um, the principle is, is kind of simple, actually. You take you take the scatter plot and you vary the cutoff in both directions until you optimize the Matthew correlation coefficient. So you, you basically what you do is that you discretize the data into resistant and sensitive, and you try to optimize the cutoff between the two studies. And here, for nilotinib, finally, you've got a perfect consistency on one, because the two studies agree to consider those four points are sensitive. There is no disturbing cases. There is no inconsistency inconsistencies, and all the rest is resistant. So finally, we had a measure that could, com could look at the concurrence for highly targeted therapies. Now the problem is that if you do that with uh, other types of drugs like, like this one with a broader effect, uh, which is uh, PD-032-5901 uh, is a MEK inhibitor here, you can see that a lot of cells, some lines are affected. You can see that a lot of, of cases are discordant between the two studies. In the inconsistency area, you have a lot of those points. <coughs> so here, the adaptive Matthew correlation coefficient is only 0.6 and not like and not perfect as it was for nilotin. <coughs> and again, you can do that with gene expression as, uh, expression as well. There is, there is no reason why you, you should not be able to do so. So that's what we did. And we'll, okay. um, that's what we did. Um, and again, we observed that gene expression was significantly more correlated than drug sensitivity. So I would say our conclusion at this stage is that however hard you look at those data, gene expression seems to be always uh, more consistent than drug sensitivity data. But does it matter? I mean, we care if those studies looked at biomarkers. We don't really care about the consistency or the concordance or the reproducibility of the data if the biomarkers could be discovered in both studies. So. If you look, at, if you read the paper, they found a lot of very well-known biomarkers, so that's reassuring. That means that those data are real and biologically meaningful. Uh, so, for instance, they found the every B2 expression for lapatinib, or as I said, NQ1 for uh, for uh, uh, 17 AG. But if you spend 10 million dollars to generate those data, I guess that's not to find the big known biomarkers. So let's take a look at new biomarkers and let's let's try to find 
um, biomarkers in both studies and see how much of, of the biomarkers seems to overlap between the two studies. So we did something, we designed a very, very simple model where uh, we relate gene uh, drug sensitivity data, that is why, with the gene expression, we control it with tissue type. Tissue type is, is so those cancer cells come from different tissue types, and tissue type is, is strongly associated with drug response. So we want to find biomarkers that go beyond uh, just the, the predictive value of tissue type, so that's why we control for it. And we basically extract beta y, which is more or less the strength and the significance of your biomarkers. So this is what, what, you, what you get when you do this exercise. There are a few drugs where you see some kind of correlation between the two studies, uh, where a biomarker is actually highly significant in both studies. So, so that's good news, but for the most vast majority of, of, of the drugs, it was not the case. So we then, but that might, we, we use a FDR of 20%. That's what they use in their original study. That might be a bit uh, not stringent enough somehow to lose of a cutoff, there are too many points, so I decided to vary that cutoff and be much more stringent. So here you can see the correlation of the biomarkers with increasing, actually decreasing FDR cutoff. So on the right side you have 1%, so those are very, very, very significant biomarkers. And, and on the right, uh, left side you have like all the biomarkers together. And you can see that for some drugs you have this very nice evolution like 17AG or uh, TEA6, Nine four, I think six eighty four, um, where you have, you see that that correlation of the biomarkers increases with the stringency, with the significance of the biomarkers. So that's very good news. But for a lot of those of those drugs, it's actually you have this weird bell shape where the most significant biomarkers completely disagree between the two studies. So that was a bit concerning, but again, gene expression might not be very predictive. Who knows? So we did something. That I found very stupid at the beginning, but it, it, it was kind of powerful to drive the message home. What we did is that we artificially created perfectly concordant drug sensitivity data between the two studies and perfectly concordant gene expression data between the two studies to see what was the effect really. Is it the noise in the gene expression data that, that basically uh, prevent the search for uh, robust bio, reproducible biomarkers, or is it the noise in the drug sensitivity data? So. You have the correlation of the original um, uh, biomarkers on the left side. The two first uh, plots, those are where we fix the gene expression data. So we take, for instance, the gene expression data from CCLA and duplicate it for CGP, so they are perfectly concurrent. Or we do the same for CGP, doesn't matter. And we didn't see a huge increase in terms of reproducibility of the biomarkers. But when you do that with the drug sensitivity data, when you make them perfectly concurrent, then suddenly correlation of biomarkers is, is, is as high as you would expect, something like more than uh, eight, uh, correlation of 0.8. So we strongly believe that this is the noise in the drug sensitivity data that prevents you from uh, finding robust biomarkers. So we decided to investigate that in a little bit more details. What makes those two studies quite different? So that's a paper we published in Cancer Research last year. And we looked at every step in the protocol, in those experimental protocols, and try to understand how those studies differ. And actually, if you look at the green box, so there are many, many steps. So those protocols are extremely complex. Uh, in the, the green boxes are conserved because of our steps conserved because of two studies, and the red are discordant, obvious discordance um, um, between uh, experimental protocols. So here I'll focus on a few. Uh, for instance, to use the different pharmacological assays, so the way they actually measure cell viability, uh, what's different into, into the two studies. Um, they use also some uh, different modeling of the drug dose response curves. So the combinational aspects technique they use to compute AUC and IC50 was kind of different too. So we first investigated the pharmacological assay. If you just have two studies, you don't need. But if you introduce a third study, uh, you may be able to uh, infer a bit more information regarding those discrepancies. So we decided to uh, name uh, LHM and Donald Wong actually curated a lot of pharmacogenomics data. And we decided to go after a big data set from uh, Glasgow Swiss Farm where they screened 300 cell lines on, on 19 compounds. And luckily, we were lucky enough to get 200 cell lines in common between the three studies. Unfortunately, they looked only at, they looked, uh, only at two drugs that were in common. 
between, between um, the three studies, uh, Paclitaxel, which is the cytotoxic drug, and uh, Latinib. But what was very important is that CCA and GSK use the same pharmacological assay. So if pharmacological assay has a major impact on, on the, the drug sensitivity measurements, we should see that um, CCA and GSK are always more correlated uh, between each other than CGP and GSK. And that's exactly what we saw. For lapatinib, even so the correlation is not great, you can see that it's much higher between CCA and GSK. And same thing for uh, paclitaxel. So we know for sure that pharmacological assay matters. What else? The way they fitted the drug dose response curve could be very different too. Some, some use a very simple sigma model, some use a ERP of, of model, so it, it could really affect the way you find the IC50 or you, you compute the AUC. So uh, with Jales Atikani in my lab, uh, here in the room as well, we went back to the raw data and tried to understand how those curves, how those curves look and, and, and how to compute a better statistics. And that's where the title of my book comes from. So some cases are extremely good, like a beautiful consistency between the two studies. Some are extremely discordant, like you cannot have more discordant than the bad, but some are really, really ugly. We really don't know what happens, what happened for those experiments. It's like some, someone messes with the, the drug dosage or something like this, it's going up and down, it doesn't make any sense. Is it a problem of normalization, drug concentration, something else, we're not sure. But at this stage I can tell you that we saw enough of those curves to build some special QC and, and remove them, remove them from, from the analysis. So now the question is, can you improve the reproducibility between those two studies by trying to apply the same approach, computational approach to compute AUC? Um, that's what we did with a very simple trapezoidal uh, rule. But as you can see, so in red you have the published, the, the, the correlation between the two published AUC per drug, AUC estimators uh, per drug. And then in blue you have the recomputed AUC and, and uh, in, <coughs> in green, you have the AUC that has been computed only for the common concentration range. Something I forgot to tell is that you can see that the, the two here, the two uh, dif the two different studies actually looked at different drug concentration range ranges, which is a very important factor in the experimental protocol as well. If you look at very very high dosage, you always kill cells just by the pressure of the drug, I guess. But if you if you look at very small concentration range. Maybe all the cell lines will be resistant just because you didn't uh, reach a level of toxicity or efficacy that's really required. So here we took only the common concentration range to get rid of that factor, but it didn't really help. You can see that sometimes our re-estimation is better, so, and most of the time the published ABC is better, mainly because I guess they, they, they had a better uh, normalization protocol than, than we do. So we didn't really manage to improve the reproducibility by almost, um, implementing an homogeneous uh, summarization <coughs> uh, uh, technique. So there is another problem that you should maybe consider, is the fact that those signs between the two studies, even so they have the same name, they might be different. Right? So if you look at, the two, at those two papers, they made a very good job at, at pretending to ignore each other, the existence of each other, but if you dig into the supplementary information of CCLA, they actually refer to the fact that they check the identity of their cell lines against CGP. So that's the only evidence I ever found that those two studies were aware of each other. So, okay, you can you can take it for granted, but actually, uh, Rene Quevedo and Trevor Slav in the room as well uh, decided to leverage the SNP data we had for those uh, two studies to actually check the identity of the cell lines. In blue, you have the SNP fingerprint, uh, the percentage of SNP shared between uh, two different cell lines. So um, you can see that it's more or less at 50%, center around 50%. And the identical cell lines, they have this beautiful distribution close to one. But there is a small set of cell lines that have exactly the same name between the two studies, but seems to, to somehow have different uh, SNP. So you may question their identity. Fortunately or unfortunately for me, this is a small subset. So it's hard to draw any conclusion from this very small subset. But if you look at the expression patterns of the perfectly identical cell lines uh, match at the SNP level versus the one that seems to mismatch and the one that seems to be different, 
there is a slightly less concurrence in terms of, of expression, but that's not very significant. I was expecting the blue box to be at the level of the white blocks if they were really different. And in terms of drug sensitivity, same kind of story, uh, not statistically significant. You may believe that some of the drug inconsistency may be due to the fact that those sirens were actually different between the two studies. But we're still investigating that, that issue. It's kind of interesting. Okay. At the end of the day, the problem is the following. Again, if you dig into the supplementary information of the CTP paper <coughs> this time, you'll find a very, very, very interesting plot. Actually, it's not even a plot. It's a sentence. They said, um, we reproduced for a given drug, which is contradicting, we reproduced the experiment at two different locations using the same protocol. One was MGH, the Massachusetts Central Hospital in Boston, and the other one, uh, the other experiment, experiment was done at the Wellcome Trusting Institute. So they used the same protocol, the same sunrise, the same drug. And they reported a cross period of 36, which is highly significant. But when you actually plot the point, uh, uh, display the point, and when you you actually convert it into a correlation, you get only a correlation of 57. So for me, that, that is very problematic because it somehow gives you the upper bound of reproducibility you can ever reach with, let's say, a drug with broad effect, which is the case for cancer testing. Um, and that's somehow uh, a bit depressing uh, on my side because I was really hoping to be able to, to manage to correct some of the biases and, and get uh, higher reproducibility. But even if you, if you control all those factors and use exactly the same protocol, you get that kind of correlation. So, and that's almost the end of, of my presentation. So, um, we basically concluded that the, the, the lack of reproducibility is due to uh, maybe different uh, experimental protocols. We had pretty convincing evidence for the pharmacological assay. Not so much evidence for the identity of the solid. I think there, there were too few to draw any conclusion. Um, we are working to improve the computational uh, pipeline uh, to have more robust statistics of drug sensitivity, but we have not been very successful so far. Um, so the point is really we need to understand where that noise is coming from. Is it because of the technical variation? Is it because of the biological variation? Is it because of the use of different protocols? And Rutgers and, and other people uh, keep keep asking me whether one data set is wrong and which one it is. So they, you know that would be very simple to just trash one and use the other one. But I think it's not that simple. For some drugs, CGP might be very good. For some other drugs, CCLE might, CCLE might be uh, uh, better. Who knows? So until you have more studies to assess the reproducibility, you won't be in a position to to just select the good experiments. And we were not the only ones somehow to uh, show that. Right, short after our paper, uh, Adam Marjorie, who was on the CCLE paper, actually uh, tried to do what we did for the Jamia paper, tried to predict um, um, a therapy response, drug response in cancer science using CCLE CGP. And he also noticed uh, some of the uh, inconsistency and in especially the difficulty of validating. And another very interesting paper published recently by uh, the John Bruckner's group actually highlighted the inconsistency in uh, the mutation profile. So it looks like only 57% of the mutation code in one study was actually also uh, called in the other study. And the rest was unique to the study. So I would argue, even so, we, we had a glimpse of those data and we saw that the consistency was not great. On, at our level, we said like one bad news at a time. So I'm very happy that they publish that completely independently from us. And to wrap up, uh, I would say this is definitely a very, very challenging issue. Um, and if we do not manage to do it on science, I'm a bit skeptical that we can do it in vivo. Uh, again, I'm happy to be wrong. I'm, I would be curious to, to hear your, your uh, self thoughts about it. Um, but then practical solutions to someone try to fix those, those issues, we need to understand the reproducibility of those cell based uh, high throughput screening. If the level of reproducibility that we observed is actually the upper bound, and I may agree with this in the sense that CGP and CCA groups are extremely good, well established groups. They knew what they were doing, they used standard protocols. Um, if this is the maximum of 
reproducibility, we should use those data differently. Um, and maybe perform some kind of meta-analysis to try to extract your consistent signals and to find better biomarkers. That's uh, one of the research focus of the lab. And this is just the beginning. We're dealing here with cell lines. Those are very, very simple models. In vivo, you have tumor heterogeneity. Uh, that is a major factor that you cannot really take um, into account when you deal with um, single cell lines. Um, also, another topic that is kind of interesting, but so it's a bit early to talk about it, is the fact that it would be nice to find biomarkers for drug combination, these sort of single agent therapies. Um, the rationale is that nowadays, uh, more and more drug combinations are used in clinics, so it's not so much about a single drug, it's about a, a drug combination. But of course, as you can imagine, that is even a more complex uh, problem to solve. So, a last slide. Um, Mining those existing pharmacogenomic data is definitely fun. Uh, you learn a lot about the, the, those things. And this is how I feel every day. I like playing with those data and they come for free to, to, my, uh, to my workstation and I can analyze them like forever. Uh, but that's how most people perceive your work, right? You're like the future trying to steal the data and say bad things about that data. So I really hope that somehow um, this concept will um, uh, will change over time with that we all work for uh, uh, to actually increase the value of those data because there is no doubt that those, those data are extremely valuable. It's just that you have to find a way to make them um, to make them extremely uh, even more valuable. Somehow. So those are the people I would like to thank, especially people in the lab. We saw a few names in the slides, but actually it's really a team effort. Um, we are all involved in that big. Uh, Big story, and those are my collaborators, uh, especially at Dana Farber in Boston, uh, Igor Arts and John Patrick Bush, and Andrew Beck, who, has been, uh, who have been extremely uh, uh, key in, in those studies, and Nikolai Jukirbak as well. Thank you very much. So that, that's great. Um, I, was, I was reminded of a, of a trick used in an early microarray study, actually by our own Tim Hughes here, who worked on the Rosetta Compendium, uh, looking at drug response in, uh, and, and response to deletions in yeast. And they used a, a trick where they had a whole bunch of replicates of exactly the same condition, exactly the same strain. And their explanation was sort of stress response, if I'm remembering right, it might not be, but stress response genes or growth, growth correlated genes that vary considerably in the replicates of exactly the same condition. And so they downweighted those genes. And they did, so you could imagine doing your study again, having removed or downweighted these sort of irreproducible genes, if you could identify what they were, using a subset of the shared cell lines, or somehow using replica data to get rid of those or downweight them. And the other thing that sort of occurred to me is that by choosing the single best predictor, or even the top 30, if they were all from the same cluster of expression, if that was all driven by some growth response, you know, growth correlated or, or stress response cluster, then you could be looking at the most irreproducible cluster. Yeah. That would be bad luck. But, uh, yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's true. So for the yeah. first comment, that's, that's very uh, interesting. I think from a practical point of view, it's going to be very hard to, to implement because those are very costly uh, experiments. I, I'm not a yeast guy, but Maybe it's, it, they managed to get more replicates for each experiment? No, no, just using the replicates you've got and the shared cell lines between the studies. Go look at all of them or some subset. Yeah, so of them. n equal 2 then? Yeah, yeah n equals 2. Well, but, even but, even but, at that level, you can estimate well, the variance. But for each gene, you have many n equals 2 cases, right? So, so, so yeah, you've got a thousand, so you have 500, 500 cases of n equals 2 for each gene. Mm -hmm. And you could look for reproducibility across pairs of. of yeah, that's of true. Cell you, you could somehow focus your search to the genes that seem to be extremely reproducible across, across the two studies. Yeah, or at least throw out the most irreproducible. But, but again, yeah. this is this is going back to this to this very simple um, experiment where, even if the yeah, it. Even if the if the if the gene expression are perfectly concordant, it doesn't solve the issue. It's really the drug sensitivity data that are problematic. That's a, so that's if a you fair even, point. Then we have to worry about where they're getting the drugs from. I guess, but, uh, so anyway, so I, I guess, more. yeah. So so that that's uh, and what was your second question? Oh, it was it was related. Uh, it had to do with 
had to do well. It had to do with your biomarker methods using the top 30. Are we worried about maybe all top all of the top 30 come from the same cluster? Yeah, no, no, that, that, so, that's so true. So it's sort of one yeah. principal component, and you're being fooled by the top component. Uh, even uh, so, one of the methods is using um, minimum redundancy, maximum relevance. So we really try to diversify the signal uh, the best we could, and we st they still didn't fix the issue. So I, I really, at this stage. I know we all want to focus on the gene expression data because that's where we're excited and that's where we think the complexity is. But if the outcome data don't fit, there is nothing really to predict. We had another one back here. Uh, so I guess an take-home message of that uh, presentation is that uh, you said that none of the data sets are wrong, but they're different. Mm -hmm. They're wrong in their small ways. So uh, maybe there's a systematic uh, sort of a bias in the data that would make it, uh, that, that the data out in, that they are different from one study to the other. So maybe there's a transformation between the data sets uh, that would fix this bias. So I would love hours, to think like, it's true. Uh, if you say, made, made a PCA, a principal component analysis of all the drug responses across the cell lines, do you see the same cell lines being more similar or would they be more similar to other cell lines of that? One data set than the other. Yeah, I, I agree. Okay, I, we we would all love to love to see a, a mathematical transformation that would fix the issue because it's free, right? And that's why we worked so hard to try to design new computational pipelines to try to come up with more robust statistics and, and some of what what and, and some other stuff. But what I like in your comment is that it might be that some cells are extremely consistent, and some cells might be more consistent. So. Why not focusing on the consistent signal? Maybe maybe they are easily they are easier to work with. Maybe they react better to different medium, temperature, conditions, whatever, right? So I, I like the idea of trying to narrow down to actually remove the bad parts from those studies to improve the reproducibility. And I think that's a major uh, problem in those studies. They call it high throughput for a reason. It's because it's high throughput, but it's also and it comes with noise, right? So the way people use those kind of technologies before was to screen, to screen an insane number of compounds and select the top 10, whatever. That's not what they do here. What they do here is that they try to leverage every single point. Even so, they know that in some ranges, maybe for some summarize or for some drugs, they know their measurement is not as reliable than for other summarize and other drugs. So I think the take-home message is that maybe by Focusing on the real, reliable science and drugs and experiments, you may increase drastically the, the, the reproducibility. It would be fun to actually overfit. It would be fun to do an optimization and see, even even if you take all the the, the equivalent, um, all the pharmacogenic studies, what's the subset of points that seems to be the best, the most reproducible, and then you start from here and you try to understand what makes them different from the rest of the points. So I'm trying to take a couple more questions. One here. Yeah. So um, in these drug studies, they use a lot of compounds, and we also know some information about the, the protein target of these compounds. And in your study, you find fine markers that represent the specificity of the reaction. So I'm, so, what, I'm wondering how much overlap is between the, the protein, protein targets of this drug and your biomarkers. Yeah, that's a fair point. So we looked only at gene expression imitation of our study, but for some drugs we found the protein target to be actually the gene expression that is at the top one um, Some other times it's not, more than often. So I, we didn't find a very striking association between, here we don't, true, the target should be the biomarker, right? If the target is not expressed, you're not supposed to have any response. But it's not, it's not always that simple, and there, is, there are a lot of other biomarkers that may be more predictive than the target itself. And the target is at the protein level while we look at gene expression. So this one-to-one this -one relationship is actually pretty tricky uh, to find in our data. I think it might be true for two of the drugs uh, out of the 50 we tested. Uh, so the cell lines, uh, thing, uh, I don't know which uh, you use two cell lines, CGP or CCLE? Or? Those studies, yeah. 
Yeah, so uh, basically based on my experience, uh, no cell line is pure because if you can track back to the whole cell lines development, basically you have the transformation of the tissues. So in my hands, I have noticed uh, some cell lines. Uh, actually, if you do the single colony, single cell colony analysis, some cell lines, a lot of cell lines, they are mixture. For example, the, the cell lines, the MDA231 uh, cell lines, so it's kind of uh, uh, morphology, they could be three or or, or uh, three or four different morphology could be different cell lines. So uh, my, my suggestion or comment is uh, uh, a lot of cell lines now they have a lot of genetics or uh, information like uh, PCJ, they have a lot of information genetics and also they have the uh, whole genome or whole axon from sequencing. Probably uh, that one can tell you some information if you can integrate that data with uh, drug responsibility or consistent or in, uh, data maybe can help you develop more models uh, to, to it, it's, it's, it's actually pretty uh, linked to, to the other comments that yeah. not all semi are equal. No, no, cell, no, no cell lines are pure. No, 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 yeah, no cell lines are pure. I would say that some evolve yes, maybe very some differently, are... much more differently than other cell lines. So we also, so for the moment we just look at cell line identity. And the, the, some of the um, 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 ambiguous cell lines that they have the same name but not really the same thing, are they the same cell lines that evolve? very differently, uh, or are they really different cell lines, or is it contamination? So th those are all question marks, and I agree that they should play a role in the inconsistency we observe. Is it a major role? <coughs> I don't know. Uh, if you consider that cell lines are unstable models, don't use them, but if you think that the tumor is more stable than a cell line, you're, you're wrong. So I think th there is a trade-off here. Uh, I agree that those cell lines are not pure, this is some of the simplest model we have, models we have so far. So we can have to deal with that inconsistency. It would be great if we can measure it and, and, and take it into account in those biomarker studies. That I agree. So actually, I saw a bunch more questions back here, but we're after five, and if the pizza gods are smiling on us, there's actually pizza next door in the- I don't like to be responsible of the lack of pizza. I, like pizza. No, they even, you, can, you can blame me if there's not pizza. But, uh, but maybe we can uh, at least uh, hang out in the black room and, and uh, pester our speakers uh, for the hour to come. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much. Please let's thank both of our speakers.